always, we're very thankful for your presence tonight. We are so appreciative to be here. We're thankful for the invitation to share the good news of our Lord and our Savior. Tonight, we want to talk about the good news of salvation. You can be saved tonight. We saw it done last night, and we're very thankful for that. We pray that if it is your need, you will make the same decision and be saved tonight. It is, at least in my estimation, the greatest question ever asked. The jailer fell down before his prisoners and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? That's the question. That question is so important because the answer to that question will determine whether or not one spends eternity in heaven with God or in hell, eternally separated from God. It was asked when the first gospel sermon was preached in Acts chapter 2, men and brethren, what shall we do? That's what they said. The jailer asked his prisoners, sirs, what must I do to be saved? If this question is asked and answered incorrectly, it has terrible consequences and that also makes it very important. For one could be a religious person believing they have asked the question and based on the answer they received, they respond to that answer, and then they could live their entire lives believing that they have done precisely what God says, only to find out in eternity too late that they didn't. It's hard to imagine a person living a life religiously, giving that life in dedication and service to the Lord, meeting Jesus and hearing these words. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not do many wonderful works in thy name, cast out demons in thy name, and do the many wonderful works? And then I will profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. These are religious people, believing that they have done these things in the name of the Lord. But because they were given the wrong answer to this question, they will ultimately be apart from our Lord eternally. What must I do to be saved? It's one of the reasons that those of us who are Christians, those of us who are members of the Lord's church, the one we spoke about last night, it's one of the many reasons we take it so seriously. It's one of the many reasons we try to share this good news with any and everyone who would be willing to listen. Very likely, if you have tried to share the gospel with someone, you have likely found this situation where the study is going along fine up until you get to the subject of baptism. And very likely, it's in that moment that you will be told you don't have to be baptized. All you have to do is believe. Typically, what will happen is the member that is of the Lord's body will say, no, 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 here's a passage that says you have to be baptized, and they'll share that passage. And then the person with whom they're studying will respond, no, 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 here's a passage that says belief. And you say, well, yeah, you got to believe, but yeah, you got to be baptized. And they say, no, all you got to do is believe. And there's this backwards and forwards, and ultimately an impasse happens. And the study slowly but surely stops and get bogged down, and there is no agreement on the subject of salvation with really no ability to move forward. It's happened to me on more than one occasion. And tonight I'd like to share with you the good news that we can resolve that problem. We can get past that impasse, and you can leave here tonight knowing exactly what you need to do to be saved. I'm doing a study right now in my mind, working on a sermon. The tentative title is Due Diligence. You owe it to yourself to do your due diligence to get the right answer to this question. And even if at the end of our study tonight you say, well, I don't believe that, we beg you tonight to at least study along and do your due diligence to see if the things we say are so. As we said last night, we're not asking you to join our church. It's not within our ability to save anybody. But surely the Bible has the answer, and that's what we want to study tonight. 
First, let's acknowledge the issue. What is the issue in these kinds of studies? It seems like the issue is baptism and belief, but that's not the issue at all. The real issue is understanding faith. The problem is people very often are taught the wrong thing about what that word means and what ultimately it requires of us. A few, a few very important points that we need to understand, and let me offer this to those of us who are members of the Lord's body. When we're having Bible studies with people where we can find agreement, let's find agreement. Sometimes people say things that's true, and to that end, we simply agree if it's true. For instance, if a person were to say to me, Eric, you know we're saved by faith. You know what I would say to that? I would say that's right. Well, Eric, why would you say that we're saved by faith? Because that's what the Bible says. You'll notice I didn't add the word only. The Bible says we're saved by faith. Well, where does it say that? You have your Bibles tonight. Look at Romans chapter 5. Read along with me in verse number 1 and verse number 2. The Bible says we're saved by faith. If a person says that to me, I agree. Why? That's what Paul says. Paul says in verse number one, therefore, being justified by faith. Wait, what? Are we justified? Well, yeah, we're justified by faith. Well, that's what the Bible says. And if you say that, I agree. But the Bible says more than that. Turn back a page in your Bible. Look at chapter three. Look down at verse number 24. Where there, the Bible says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. Well, which is it? It's not either or, it's both and. In fact, this same apostle will put them together in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse number 8, he will say it this way. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Here's the thing that you and I need to understand as we study the Bible. The apostles and prophets in the New Testament, they use words in the same consistent manner that God has always used those words. In other words, grace in the New Testament is grace in the Old Testament. Faith in the New Testament is faith in the Old Testament. The words don't change meaning because we change covenants. No, whatever faith means, it's always meant. Whatever grace means, it's always meant that. And so when the Bible says, for by grace are ye saved through faith, there's really never been any other way any human being has ever been saved. In fact, that is God's plan of salvation. Every man is saved by God's grace and every man is saved by faith. That's the way it works. Whatever faith means, it means always meant. Whatever grace means, it's always meant that. Have you ever noticed in Hebrews chapter 11, when the Hebrew writer wants to encourage New Testament Christians, those who are saved, as to the kind of faith they need, where does he begin? Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 4, he begins in Genesis 4. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Genesis chapter 5, by faith, Enoch walked with God. Genesis chapter 6, by faith, Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. But wait, he's talking to New Testament Christians. That's right. And he wants them to have a faith that pleases God. That's right. Chapter 11 and verse number 6, without it, you can't please God. And in verse number 13 of that chapter, the Bible says, these all died in faith. Whatever faith means, it means. In fact, he's writing to New Testament Christians and using Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Joshua as examples of the kind of faith they need. It's why the Apostle Paul would write what he does in Romans chapter 15 and verse number 4. Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. You see, what the Bible does is it's very consistent. And it asks us to learn from the examples. And by doing that, by learning from examples of salvation in the Old Testament, we can better understand salvation in the New Testament. When it comes to the subject of faith, what does it mean? That's what we want to find out because we're saved by faith. 
And without faith, no man can please God. You need faith. That's what the Bible is going to teach, but there's only two options. When we talk, if you will allow, when we talk to our denominational friends and family, sincere people, devout people, hopefully people with pure hearts wanting to do right, we're studying with them. These people have an understanding in their minds about faith. Someone has taught it to them. Here is generally what they believe. That when it comes to the subject of faith, the word faith means I believe. I don't have to do anything else. I believe God sent Jesus to die for my sins, and I believe that. And that belief saves me. I don't have to do anything. That's one idea of faith. In fact, the person you're sitting with, you're both using the word faith, but you're meaning it very differently. This is what they believe. If you're here tonight and you're from a denomination or some other religious group, if I'm wrong, please see me at the back. But every person I've talked to and had studies with, this is their understanding of faith. If I were to stand on this side and try to represent what those of us in the Lord's church mean by when we use the word faith and therefore what ultimately I would say the Bible teaches, I would say that we say the Bible says faith does mean I believe God, yes, and I do Whatever God says. Faith means I believe and do nothing. Or faith means I believe and I do whatever God says. One of these is taught in the Bible. One of these will lead to salvation. One of them will not. These are the only two options I'm aware of when it comes to the subject of faith and whether or not we're doing what God enjoins upon us. The question tonight is not really what does a member of the Lord's church say or what does a member of a denomination say. The question is always the same in Bible study. It's what does the Bible say. This evening, I'd love it if you'd study along and open your Bibles. Where should we begin? Well, let's begin the first time we find the idea of salvation in the Bible. That would be Genesis chapter 6. If you have your Bibles, let's turn back there and see what the Bible teaches relative to salvation. Genesis chapter 1 and 2 teaches us that God is the sovereign ruler of heaven and earth. Genesis chapter 3 teaches us that sin has entered into the world and we have a problem we cannot solve. Genesis chapter 4 invites men into sacrifice and worship to God. One does it by faith, one does it not by faith. One's accepted, one's rejected. Genesis chapter 5 is a genealogy. And we find ourselves in Genesis chapter 6, and for the first time in human existence, on a large scale, the idea of salvation is broached. What do we find? Our outline with regards to this chapter is this. First of all, there is always a problem. The problem can be seen in the first five verses, particularly verse number 3 down to verse number 5, where the Bible says, The Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, Because he also is flesh, nevertheless his days shall be 120 years. There were the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and afterward, afterward, the sons of God came into the daughters of men, bore children to them, those that were mighty men who were of old, men of renown. These are not angels and men. These are just men. The word men appears a couple of times in the text, and Matthew 22 teaches very plainly that angels don't marry, nor are they given in marriage. These are just men. Number number three, verse number five, teaches us what the problem is. The Bible says, Then the Lord God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. That is the problem. It's sin. It's always the problem. Sin deserves punishment, and God decrees that it will happen. Verse number six and verse number seven, that's our second point. The Bible says the Lord was very sorry that he had made man on the earth. It grieved him at his heart. The Lord said, I will destroy man. I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the earth, from the man to the animals, the creeping things, the birds, the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. That's the punishment. In fact, it's already been decreed. God will destroy man for sin. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. God says judgment is due, and it is. When it comes to the subject of salvation, our third point is that God always has a person. He uses someone to invite people to be saved. He always does that. In this case, that person is Noah. Beginning in verse number 8 down to verse number 12, you'll find that. The Bible says, but Noah found, King James has the word grace here. 
But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Verses 9 to 12 tells us about Noah. He was a righteous man just in all of his generations. He walked with God, the Bible will say. After God calls Noah, God always does this. God always has a plan. There's always a plan of salvation. There is something that God will inform men of. That's true here. Verses 13 down to verse number 17 is that plan. God will say to Noah, make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark. You'll pitch it within and without. And this is the height and the width of the length. 300 cubits by 50 by 30. Three stories, a window within a cubit and a door. God always has a plan. That plan is to build this ark. But that brings us to the next point. God always has a place. In chapter 7 and verse 23, the Bible will say that those who blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the land, from animals to creepy things to birds of sky, and only those that were only Noah was left together with those that were with him in the ark. Salvation is in the ark. Who put it there? God did. There's always a place where people are saved. Afterward, there's always pardon. God, because of Noah's faith, he saves. That's what the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 7. God saved Noah because Noah did what God required. When we want to figure out what faith is and how it works, we begin by noting how does one even get it? How do you come to have faith and what is it? Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, the Bible will say, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In other words, in order to have faith in God, you must have word from God. There must be something God has said in order for you to trust God. That's the way it works. How did it work here? You remember we said that a man is saved by grace through faith. See it here in Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 7. What is the grace of God? The first thing you'll want to note is that God has already decided to judge the world. The end of all flesh is come before me. The reason that's noteworthy is Noah does not know that yet. How will Noah come to know that? He'll need God's grace. You see, grace is God extending himself to mankind. It's God's offer of pardon. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14, the Apostle Paul will say, The grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us. You remember, if we could part for a moment, if you remember Sunday, we talked about 1 Corinthians 2, 8 to 13. The reason that those passages are so important is because when it comes to the mind of God, you and I can't know what's in his mind unless he reveals it to us. He does that graciously. He doesn't owe us that information. He's not in our debt. Man has sinned. He deserves judgment. God has decreed it. And yet, before the judgment comes, God offers grace. Grace is going to teach Noah what he needs to do to have faith. That's the way it works. Verse 7, it's already been decided. But look at verse 13. It reads a lot like verse 7, except there's a little difference. And the difference is in the first three or four words of the verse. In verse number 7, the Bible says, The Lord said... I will destroy man whom I have created. Question, to whom did he say that? That's one of those passages where God is simply talking amongst the Godhead. God said that within the Godhead. I will destroy it. God said that. Well, that's said and that's decreed and that's done. But by his grace, he'll reveal that to Noah. You can see the difference in verse 13. It doesn't say the Lord said. No, in verse 13, it says, God said to Noah. What's he say to Noah? The exact same thing. 
the end of all flesh has come before me, I will destroy man whom I've created upon the earth. Well, now Noah knows because God's grace has taught him what God is going to do. Now he knows that. But listen, Noah still doesn't know what to do to fix the problem. When the Lord says, I'm going to destroy the earth, Noah lives on the earth too. Up to that point, he's simply been informed of the judgment. But how will he escape it? First, there's grace. God will explain. God will reveal. And then there are commands. And then there is faith. It always works that way. Grace commands faith. The faith is always in God. I trust God. The word of God. That's what faith does. See it in verse number 14. After God says, verse 13, I will destroy the world, he tells Noah that. Verse number 14 says, make you an ark. Well, who is being told to make an ark? Noah is. When is he told to make the ark? Right after God said, I'll destroy the world. Now, the only question is, does Noah believe God? Does Noah believe verse 13? If Noah believes what God said, remember, faith is, I believe God. Faith is, I believe God. What's the difference? Faith is, I believe God, and I do whatever he tells me. Did God tell Noah to do anything? Yes. He said, make thee an ark. Imagine for just a moment, your name is Noah. Imagine for just a moment, you heard the God of heaven say to you, I'm going to destroy the world. Wherever your address is, it's on the world. And now he just told you, I'm going to destroy it. You make an ark. Let me ask you this. Do you build the ark? Your friends and mine go to worship service, and a preacher tells them, when it comes to the subject of salvation, the first thing you need to know is you don't need to do anything. We are in the sixth chapter of our Bible. And the subject of salvation is on the table. And God has told Noah, do something. Do you do it? Do you build the ark? I hope that you would. What I know for sure is, Noah did. In chapter 6 and verse 22, the Bible says, thus did Noah According to all that God commanded him, so did he. How does it work? It always works the same way. There is grace, there are commands, and there's faith. And once the faith believes God, does what he says, then there's salvation. It won't work any other way from Genesis to Revelation. This is the sixth chapter in the Bible, and every time you see somebody saved by God, this will be the way they are saved. It won't deviate or differentiate. The only thing that will change, the only thing that will change are the specific commands between the grace and the faith. If you're Noah, you build an ark. But let me ask you this. What if you're Joshua? What if you're Joshua and you want to take Jericho? Well, I'll tell you what you'll find is you'll find a problem because Achan has stolen the Babylonian garments and the shekel of gold and he has hid them in his tent. We have a problem. Joshua is crying and God says there is sin in the camp. He has to get rid of it. They lost a battle at Ai because of that sin. There will be punishment. There will be complete destruction. 
There will be. As you work your way through this book, Rahab will know that the spies are true. They've come into this city. Rahab has a problem. She says to those spies, we know, we know God is going to give you this city. They are going to destroy Jericho. Rahab will be the person used, and the plan will be get into your house and tie a scarlet line outside of the window. Her house will be the place of salvation. What will happen when they come? You will find the exact same thing. The only thing that will be different is Rahab won't build a house or an ark. She will get into her house. When it comes to Joshua and taking the city, Joshua won't build an ark and he won't get into a house. He will be told, march around the city. Every time, it'll be the exact same way. It will be God's grace. That grace will reveal something, commands, and then the person or persons will have to trust God and do what he says. But let me ask you a question. If you were Rahab and the spies told you, get into your house and get your family into your house, and when we come, we won't destroy anybody in your house, but everybody else will be destroyed. And if anybody leaves, they'll be destroyed. Let me ask you this. Would you have gotten in Rahab's house? If you would have gotten in Rahab's house, what you're saying is, I understand that faith means I believe God and then I do whatever he says. If he tells me to build an ark, I'll build an ark. If he tells me to get into a house, I'll get into a house. If he tells me to march around a city one time a day for six days and then seven times on the seventh day, then I'll march around the city. Did I come up with the idea to build the ark? I didn't. Neither did Noah. Did I come up with the idea to get into Rahab's house? I didn't. Neither did Rahab. Did Joshua come up with the idea to march around? No, Joshua wouldn't have come up with that idea. That's God's grace and then his commands and then faith. It never works any other way. We don't have time tonight, but I would just encourage you to go read Numbers 13 and 14, and you can see this kind of faith in, in, in practice. When people believe God but won't do what he says, that would be Numbers 13 and 14. In fact, God actually says in Numbers 14, 11, how long will it be ere they believe me? One of the more sad things about this discussion is that people are told that this is faith, that all you have to do is believe and do nothing else. In Numbers 13 and 14, God calls this unbelief. He doesn't call this belief. When you refuse to do what God says, he calls that unbelief. Those spies, God said, they did not believe. Joshua and Caleb, however, did believe and were willing to do what God says. I studied with someone. We went through this material. We were talking backwards and forwards, and then they said to me, you know, everything you said is true. However, all of these people you've talked about were already in covenant with God. And therefore, they're simply obeying God out of being in covenant with God. Now, I don't mind telling you that sometimes when you hear new things, it throws you for a moment. And at first, I don't mind telling you that threw me. Because when you read Genesis chapter 6, it will say of Noah that Noah was a just man and righteous in his generation, and Noah walked with God. And when you read Joshua, certainly Joshua is in covenant with God. I would hurriedly argue, though, Rahab is not. Rahab is not in covenant, and in James chapter 2, she's credited with faith. But there is a man in 2 Kings chapter 5, a man by the name of Naaman. He is a Syrian. He's not under covenant. Let me ask you this. How did he get his leprosy removed? He got his leprosy removed by grace, by command, and by faith. It doesn't matter whether you're under covenant or not. 
In fact, I encourage New Testament Christians to appreciate the fact that the faith that moves us to obey God and become Christians is the same faith we use to sustain us as Christians. We don't have two different kinds of faith. We don't have a faith that we obey God to become his child and then a different faith we live with as his child. That's not the way it works at all. It's the same faith. Naaman demonstrates that. How was Naaman saved? Does he have a problem? Absolutely. The problem of leprosy is going to take Naaman's life. Does he have a person? Absolutely. The little maid said to him, oh, that my master were with the prophet. He would cleanse you. Naaman had some missteps. He sent to his king, and then his king sent to the king of Israel. She never said the king. She said the prophet. When at last they got to the prophet, let me ask you this. What do you suppose that if one is a prophet, he has? He has the word of God because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. She knew that if he could get to the prophet, he'd get to the God of the prophet. The prophet has God's word. What's God's word to Naaman? Go dip in the Jordan seven times. We don't have to wonder about Naaman's reaction to that. It's a lot like the reaction of these good people. Naaman was wroth. Naaman was angry. Naaman said, behold, I thought. What did you think, Naaman? I thought he would call his God, he would wave his hands over the area, and I would be cleansed. You know we're not saved by what we think. We're not going to be justified by what we think. We're going to be justified by God's grace and whatever he tells us to do, and we trust him, and we do just that. If you're Noah, build the ark. If you're Rahab, get into your house. If you're Joshua, march around the walls. And if you're Naaman, don't go to the rivers of Damascus. Don't go to Parfar. Don't go to Abana. Where should you go? What did God say? The Jordan River seven times. You know, it wasn't until uh, Naaman was convinced by his servant to do what God said through the prophet that he was cleansed. And in 2 Kings 5 and verse number 14, the Bible will say that Naaman went to the Jordan River. He went down, dipped himself seven times in the Jordan River. Note the phrase, according to the word of the man of God. And what happened? His flesh was restored as the little maid said. Friends, it doesn't work any other way. Why am I telling you all of this? Because God intends for us to learn from the Old Testament that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. By the time we get to the New Testament, when the Apostle Paul says, by grace you are saved, it's not a new concept biblically. When the Apostle Paul says being justified by faith, it's not a new concept biblically. No one has ever been saved without the grace of God. If God doesn't extend his grace, once we're in sin, there's nothing we can do to get out. We can't swim our way out, think our way out, feel ourselves out, discover our, there is nothing we can do. We are drowning in sin, and all we will do is ultimately succumb if God doesn't extend his grace. But when God extends his grace, he teaches us what to do. He will give us commands. His grace will tell us, here is what you must do. And then we must trust God and do whatever he says. I don't know anybody else in the Bible ever told to build an ark, just Noah. I don't know any other city ever taken by marching around it, just Joshua. I don't know of another house that somebody was told, get into that one and stay in it, except Rahab. I don't know of anybody else in the Bible ever told to dip in the Jordan 7, except Naaman. This is why the phraseology is not accidental. We do believe God, and then we do whatever. It wouldn't matter what he said. God said, build a boat, build a boat. God said, get in the house, get in the house. God said, march around, sit, march around. It won't matter what he said. Whatever he said, trust him, do that. When we get to the new covenant, however, God only has one message. That message is the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see all of those things we saw in Genesis 6, we see when our Lord comes. When Jesus comes, the salvation, the world needs salvation. Does the world have a problem? Absolutely, the problem is sin. Romans 3.23, all of sin. 
Romans 3 and verse number 9, we before proved all under sin. The world has a problem, sin. The sin will be punished, Romans 6, 23. Wage of sin is death. Nothing's changed. God's going to judge sin. Does, there, does God have a person? Absolutely. Jesus Christ. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. There was a person in Noah, person in Rahab, person in Joshua, person in Moses, person in Naaman. There is a person today, Jesus our Lord. God so loved the world, gave his only begotten son. Jesus said we must believe in him. We have to do that. Is there a plan? Absolutely. The gospel. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Is there a plan? Absolutely. For who? Everybody. Jew first, also to the Greek, Romans 1, 16 and 17. Is there a place of salvation? Sure, always has been. There was a boat. There was a house. There was a, 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 and now there is a body. It's always a place. Jesus Christ, body. Galatians 3, 27. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Where is salvation today? 2 Timothy 2.10, Paul says, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation. Where is it, Paul? Which is in Christ Jesus. There is a place of salvation. It's in Jesus. Is there pardon if you get there? Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 11, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called the uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time, Ye were without God and without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. How did it change? But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes are far off are made nigh or near by the blood of Christ. How did you get there? Romans 6, 3 and 4. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him in baptism, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. How does it work? Same way it's always worked. God has given his grace. What has he graced the world with, Jesus? God so loved the world, he gave. There's his grace. What are the commands? Jesus is the one giving the commands. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. What must one do? He must trust God and do whatever God has said. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. If you believe and are baptized, you will be saved. Friends, if you have your Bibles tonight, look at Mark 16, verses 15 and 16 for just a second. Notice what these verses say and what they don't say. In fact, when you study your Bible, you'll want to find that out. What does it say and what does it not say? If you had something to write down on, your, on a piece of paper or some other instrument tonight, and you could write it down or type it out or whatever it is, if you could just uh, uh, just put these letters down, maybe just memorize them, the letters are a B and then a B and an S. That's what's in this verse. Now, the arrangement of that, you could write it one or two ways. You could write the B first and then followed by a B and then followed by an S. Or you could write a B followed by the S and then followed by the B. In other words, B, B, S, or B, S, B. One of these is in this verse, and one of these teaches these things. But which one is it? Verse number 16 says, he who believes, there's our first B, and is baptized, there's our second B, what will happen to that person? They shall be saved. You see, there's our S. Our friends and our family are taught. Those letters are inverted. They are taught. He who believes, B, is saved, S, and shall be baptized, B. That's just not what. I don't know, honestly, which is more so. I don't know if it's the person up here telling people. The first thing you need to know is you don't have to do anything. I don't know if that's more sad or the person believing it. But the due diligence of simply reading the Bible would have you understand that what you're being told is not written in God's word. 
And from Genesis 6 onward, no one is ever saved by doing nothing. No one is ever told, don't do anything. Not only did Jesus say it. The first time the gospel is preached is Acts chapter 2. And friends, if ever anybody had the answer to the question, you know, sometimes people make these things personal. And they start talking about preachers and gospel preachers and Christians. They start saying as if we came up with these things. All we've done is read them and studied them tonight. But even if you didn't want to hear it from me, if you just read Acts chapter 2, I would ask this, would those men know? Would the 12 men that walked with Jesus during his personal ministry, would they know? Would the 12 men who walked with Jesus during his personal ministry and saw him after he rose from the dead, would they know? The 12 men that walked with Jesus during his personal ministry and saw him after the resurrection and talked with him for 40 days about the kingdom, would they know? The 12 men who walked with Jesus during his personal ministry, saw him after the resurrection, talked with him 40 days about the kingdom, and empowered by the Holy Spirit, would they know? You see, they were asked. Men and brethren, Acts 2 and verse 37, what shall we do? If this is correct, what you should read next is, from those men to that audience, the first thing you need to understand is you don't have to do anything. But they didn't say that because that's never been the answer. I ask you again, if you were Noah, would you have built the ark? I ask you again, if you were Rahab, would you have gotten your family into your house? If you were Naaman, would you have dipped in the Jordan? Seven times? If you were Joshua, would you have marched around the wall? By the time we get to Pentecost, the only question is, will you do what every person of faith has always done? Accepted God's grace and done exactly what he said to do. You're not being asked to build a boat get into a house, march around the city, dip in the Jordan seven times. What you're being told is repent and be baptized. Would you do that? Friends, I'm not sure how you would square it in your mind if you say I would build the ark, but I won't get baptized. I would march around the city, but I won't get baptized. I would dip in the Jordan, but I won't get baptized. Friends, there's no difference. It's the way God has always and only saved us, by grace, with command, and through faith. The only thing that changes are the commands between the grace and the faith. Friends, family, it's not church slash Bible. It's just the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And we beg you tonight. That if you have been told, all you have to do is believe. Friends, Noah didn't build the ark because he just believed. He built it because he obeyed the command. All you have to do is believe. Joshua didn't march around the city because he just believed. He marched because he obeyed God. Friends, we beg you, do what they said. If you're not a Christian tonight, that's how you're saved. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The Bible teaches us to repent. That's what they said. Repent, confess the name of Jesus, and be baptized. It's interesting. Nobody in the New Testament ever argued against being baptized. Some people just don't do it. But nobody ever argues they don't need to. Find it in your New Testament. They never met a person that said, I'm going to be saved one way, and you'll be saved the way you are. They never meant that to happen. Friends, you know, we beg you, don't do that tonight. If you need to be baptized for the remission of your sins, friends, you simply be doing what God says. 
if you are his child, please help people understand. It's not just baptism. Oh, you need to be baptized. But it begins with the grace of God and our trust in God. And then we do whatever God has commanded. For your salvation, he's commanded you to be baptized. We beg you to do it. If we can help you in any way, we invite you to come as we stand and as we sing.